Yeah, I feel so proud to get someone as good as you on here. Stop that. I, I don't see these, but I bet she says that to everyone every week. Oh, I, every single one. <laughs> Ask Margaret. No. Um, <laughs> so for people that don't know you or have not heard about you, tell us more about you, Scott. Well, um, Scott from Pillow Partners. So again, I, I don't know the audience, Paula, but I'll just keep it very brief. And if you want to know more, then just prompt me. So yeah, um, Scott from Pillow Partners. Pillow, if, for those that don't know, we manage holiday homes and serviced accommodation, short-term rentals all across the UK and many other property related things as well. So at the moment, my life is just about to take off to be staycation. So you'll see one of the team at the bottom, Emma there. So building it out across the UK, slightly different business model to normal. We're trying to do things differently as an organization and you can we can chat about that more later, but um, really, really exciting times for us. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. That's fantastic. So Scott, tell me your journey to where you've got to right now. So how did you get to this position of being amazing? <laughs> well, I, if we're starting off from now and being amazing and things been good, then definitely worth taking it back because things definitely weren't always like that. But taking it back probably halfway to business when I first started. And I think my first jump into the property business was in 2005. So one of my things, leaving school with no qualifications, having no skills that were transferable, um, I couldn't get into property. I couldn't do what I wanted to do. So the business model I chose was property management because we could take these people with big houses and, you know, 100,000, 200,000 pound properties and we could manage it and take 10%. So for someone that didn't have a, any formal education, any qualification and skills, I worked for letting agents and then wanted to set up my own. So like all good entrepreneurs, we see a problem, we can believe we can do it better, and then we go on to do it. So back then, that was called Homeshore. So the, before Palo, there was Homeshore, and strangely enough, I was in air today and saw our first office. It was two flights up above a pub, and I remember taking that climb up there, and we were at the edge, and my virtual assistant gave me the edge of a desk. It literally was that size. And then we went on, and we moved office, and the virtual assistant took a desk in our office. We get bigger. We then kind of grew to two high street offices so if you think in every town and city and village there's a row a state agents row of estate agents and letting agents and that's what we were back then between 2005 and 2015 we had two high street offices we did lettings we did estate agency and i think we managed about 500 residential properties and sold specifically buy to let investments we love selling property with tenants in place so we set that estate agency up just as the market crashed in 2008 where estate agents were closing down but we saw that all these landlords were being repossessed and selling their properties so for me that was an amazing opportunity to start an estate agency because if we could take advantage of landlords selling to exit and get the money out then we could keep the properties so we'd sell it get a fee keep the property keep the tenant in everyone wins out of that the new landlord buys a property instantly with instant income and the seller gets the income to the date so now traditional estate agents love vacant possession they want to kick the tenant out sell it with no one in place then our landlord buys it and it's sitting empty for a few months didn't make sense so we set up the estate agency in 2000, and just five years ago, 2016, noticed that, listen, there was lots of problems with property management as a business model. So got a whiteboard, solved them, and we didn't realize that in Blair and his father's there, they know serviced accommodation. The word serviced accommodation is out there. But I didn't realize I had been doing that for years, well before I started in business, we just called it corporate lettings. We called it, you know, executive lettings, long-term lettings. We we didn't call it serviced accommodation. It wasn't a fancy, sexy thing. But I realized we've been doing holiday lettings for ages. Now, Homeshore as a brand sounds good as an estate agent on a high street, but Homeshore doesn't have any resonation with short-term lettings, you know, hotels, holidays. So came up with the name Pillow. Pillow Partners and decided to totally change the business model. And we managed to achieve with Pillow in probably two years what it took me a whole decade to achieve with Homeshore. So we learned the lessons and we 
basically made the best of it and changed my total mindset. So that takes us to today. And we have amazing people. Emma's on the call here. I believe the other amazing team are watching. So that's the business side of things. If you want me to go back further, Paula, I can. Well, you're for that. that I think that would help loads of people if you could go further. But the reason I want to say that is not to talk about myself or anything to do with my past, but Paula, for everyone that's watching, said, yeah, Scott, well, Scott's amazing. And you've used the word amazing a few times. And if I recall, sexy several times as well, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I remember that right. Did I? Did I? <laughs> so Paula's set, set me up to be amazing, but um, I need to take you back because that definitely wasn't the case. And for anyone watching, you can say, well, that's, that property journey is amazing. I definitely didn't start like that. So for me, I don't know, going back to when I was younger, my mother wasn't one, she would say, Scott, university isn't for people because I was brought up in Ayrshire. I won't name that village, but in the west of Scotland, statistically the worst pe place in Scotland for unemployment, drugs, and some knife violence. So I won't name that village, but brought up there and, you know, my mum's philosophy in life was, Scott, why would you get a job? Because the government pay for your flat. You can get a flat above the pub, but by the time you pay your bus fares and then get to work, it's just not worth working. So, you know, when I was younger, our family definitely were not in any way gifted when it came to money. Or, you know, my, I think my earliest memories of life as a child really was, roughly just turning a teenager and that's why we'll take amazing back to this time as being 12 so I was pretty much brought myself up at 12 Paula from 12 to 16 when I escaped and thinking back it was a life where my mum was had drink problems and for anyone that has any relatives or friends or family or anything that has that affliction of alcoholism it's it takes over their life so I was left to pretty much bring up myself which was kind of fun as a child you had a lot of freedom never really saw my mum but back in the day for all you people that you might not know this but there was power cards and 50 pence meters so who's in the call that knows what a power card is that all the posh people like a power card putting <laughs> money into your meter for electricity we had a tv that you put 50 pences in <laughs> work it because there was no electricity to put the tv but no um, no electricity in the house for days and end in a week sometimes my mum would go on a bender meant that i had to go to school with like clothes that were dirty we didn't have clothes um things like holes in your shoes you know smelling and all that type of thing that people get bullied for and I got massively bullied at school just because I, I didn't know any better at 12. We didn't have electricity there was no food I had to steal food so 15 14 15 I'd had a reputation from the police for being a thief being a criminal being a scumbag but I couldn't tell them that I'm stealing food because my mum's not around because I was Scared I'd get put into care and for some reason had loyalty to your parents. I didn't want to get her into trouble. So stealing food, getting caught by the police and not having any, any electricity and, you know, having the shops that I could steal from. There was a nice fruiters that I used to be able to steal grapes from and um, had, had my little routines to, to get through in life. And because of that, going to school, I obviously didn't try. Teachers hated me. Um, Everybody's like, Mrs. Weir, your son will never amount to anything, was a primary seven school teacher that said that. And not want to go to school because I get bullied, being scared to make eye contact with people, like walking down the street and going, there was, two way, two, there was a quick way home and then there was a three mile way home through the backfields and through forests. And I used to always run the back way. As soon as the bell went, I'd run as fast as I could to get away from everybody and go the back way and it took me like 20 30 minutes longer to go oh, home. Oh, oh, oh. So that's oh. when you're seeing amazing here people need to realize that we, we don't need to start with any benefits in life we can go from not the what not the worst in the world because there's worse places in the world but from a uk perspective poverty and um, you know trying to avoid crime trying to avoid getting caught by the police uh, that was my life Wow. So looking back to where you are now, looking back to that time in your life, what did that set you up for 
to help you be successful right now? Yeah, so I suppose if anybody's watching and thinks, well, that's quite shit, that must have been horrible. And as a parent, for the parents out there, um, things like being 12 and thinking, my mum's an alcoholic. I, I, I'm going to run away from home because I'm not getting treated. And if I run away from home, then she'll realise that she needs to take care of me. And I'd run away and slept in the streets and stole pallets and plastic and made, made a little camp. And four days in, I was starving and freezing. I thought, I'm going to go home. But I expected to go home to police vans and news and manhunt out for me. And going back and your mum not even realising you had gone. So being away for four days as a 12-year-old kid and your mum your mom not even realising because she had been out on a bender and didn't realise that you weren't there. That pretty much tells you that you need to look after yourself. So now those stories I tell you not, because it's not a pity story by any means. I would never, ever change anything that happened. Why? Well, I didn't really realise anything was wrong until the age of 12. As a young kid, you just think it is what it is. You don't realise. So I escaped that at 16. I joined the Royal Navy. It was my only option to get out. But if those stories I'm telling you, it was hundreds of horrible stories that would make me say, well, that's a shame. But those four years crafted me into having all the skills and personality or lack of personality, some would say, that I have now. And that four years is a university degree. And people go to university to learn history or arts or some other nonsense. No offence to anybody that's done four years of history or arts. It's like not criticising that. But my university degree started at 12, and that degree was in resilience and self-belief. Wow. So not a degree in life from the start, really. School of life. You've got a degree degree in resilience. And, you know, at this stage, hopefully coming out of lockdown for a couple of weeks until we're put back in. But when this hit, I saw some of the most bulletproof people I know, like absolutely invincible resilience in lockdown absolutely destroyed them. And you see people that, you know, maybe have marriage split ups or have a business failure or have something that happens in their life and, it affects them badly, but I mean, lockdown was nothing for me. That was that that was nothing compared to things in my life. So, having all that, having those things happen between twelve and sixteen, just sets you up for life. So, in no way do I see that as a negative. If I could go back in time, I wouldn't change it. And I'm not saying I would put my kids through that, but that four years just made me into. Otherwise, I would have been average, Paula, and. Okay, I'm only slightly above average because of it, but I would have just been, I would have been boring. So I, I don't see that as a negative and it was definitely the making of me. Right, it's really interesting this because when I've worked with some really good people, you know, in, in business, one of the things I've totally noticed is the resilience. And I don't know whether that's natural or they've built it up, just like yourself. You've, you've had things come to you, Scott, and you've built it up. Tell me how... What other doors resilience has opened up for you? Well, some some specifics of, and Emma has been here for some of these. Some of the things that we have managed to achieve in the last five years have, you know, people we will say, well, should we enter that competition, the tech competition, Emma, to win a trip to Silicon Valley? Yeah, you can't enter it because you're not, you're not a tech company. Oh, we enter it. Well, you can enter it, but you won't win. And we did it. We won £100,000 TV advertising. We won a trip to Silicon Valley. We, we do pitching competitions and public speaking and get opportunities that we would... that not saying that we don't deserve, but the... Not just me, and again, I'm saying me, but I'm talking about Pillow. I'm talking about the culture of the business. Everyone in Pillow has this. We don't, we've changed it now, but in the back of the shots when we first started was hashtag make it happen. It was just that resilience is make it happen. No excuses, no bullshit, no reasons why things don't work. We just go and make it happen. So yeah, being, being resilient, having a little bit of self-belief, especially when 99% of the evidence around you is telling you the opposite. My mum said, you'll never get in the Royal Navy, Matt. Everybody said, Scott, you'll never do anything in your life. You're a scumbag. You're going to be a junkie like everyone else. And at that age, there wasn't any evidence. Everything was pointing towards me being a heroin addict. When I, and I haven't done it ever, but statistically I should have because 
when I joined the Navy and come back on my first leave a year later, there was 15 of us that used to run about together. And excuse my maths here, but um, six were in jail for crime and thieving and stealing their Sega off their young brother and stealing out of shops for heroin. Four of them were dead, literally had heroin overdoses. I think one got stabbed through the eye and the other five were heroin addicts that were just junkies, the, the junkies you see in the street. So why, why out of the 16 was I the only one that escaped that life and didn't ever take that, those drugs and didn't get a criminal record and escaped? So who knows, random genetics. Let me ask you this question then. From the sounds of what I can hear, you're wanting to prove people wrong. Is that of right? Course. So, why? So, Emma knows um, we've we've won a we've won a fair share of awards, and at reception there's all these awards here, and that's not to say hi how how great am I because it's not me that wins them. I just simply I put an application form. It's a team that do it, but I say that to highlight that winning an award is is the least motivational thing for me. Eh, there's an award, people like your Facebook, it's fucking forgotten in a week, it doesn't mean anything. But not winning an award, and Emma will tell you, one of the awards we didn't win, and the feedback, Scott, you're just too ambitious. We don't really like that in Scotland, you're too ambitious for this award. And Emma knew that day when we were in Edinburgh, and I said to her, I'm going to fucking win that next year, because I'm going to make sure we do. And rejection, people telling you you can't do stuff, people stabbing you in the back or wronging you or saying you, you can't do that just dro drove me on to do everything in life so winning stuff's good and people patting you in the back and saying yeah you, there's an award there's some money or you're, you're great from clients it's totally different we need that we want our clients to to say it you know when the, the team when i got a phone call to say your property manager emma or your property manager jen or whoever um there was an email about edith and it, it just makes you buzz but for me adversity just Super, it's my superpower. It certainly is. I'm very impressed with the level of it. I definitely am, especially when I was watching you through lockdown. Right, before I go on to the next one, let me just come to the audience. Um, Blair and Alex, do you have any questions for Scott? Nope, that's all right. Who is Blair? Blair got one. Blair's got one I can see. You said, you know, you want to prove to everyone wrong, but you know, there's obviously something deeper down there that kept you going. It's not just proving everyone wrong. There was something, you know, burning inside you to make sure you didn't become one of those statistics. What was it? Funny you said the, the, the term burning inside you because I've thought about that before and when I was in there, about, and I, drinking with my mother in the pub and she'd say, why do you think you're so special, Scott? Why, why you're not just happy with what you've got? And I couldn't articulate that or express that. And I was just, just there's something burning. This isn't my life. I don't want to be in the pub drinking every day, and you know, just get somebody pregnant, and you know, have that whole there's a flat above a pub life for the rest of my life, which two generations of my family's done. There was that burning desire, and one thing I will say is definitely not talent. So the I've got dyslexia. I didn't realize until 22 when I went and got tested. My brain doesn't work at scruffy. Uh, you wouldn't be able to read my handwriting. I mean, that you'll not be able to see that, but even if you could, it's totally illegible. I can't read it and I wrote it 20 minutes ago. Um, my short term memory is bad. I'm bad at maths. I am really bad at 90. 7% of things in life. There's only a couple of things I happen to be good at. And luckily I've got an amazing team to do the other 97%, but it isn't been born with a natural sporting ability or a natural talent in anything. It's, it's literally just wanting to change my life for the better. And I wish I had an answer because I could bottle it. I could take seminars. I could sell it. I could be a Tony Robbins and sell, make a million pounds for saying daft words that don't make sense or motivational quotes. I could, I could bottle it and sell it, but I don't have the answer. But it's just something, exactly as you said, that burning desire, that fire in your belly, that there needs to be something more than this. I can't, maybe this is what I'm given, but, you know, life just, this isn't for me. There's, there's something else there, and I'm going to die trying to get it. Thank you very much. Cheers. Scott, dyslexia. Most entrepreneurs have dyslexia. Tell me how you battled your dyslexia and won it. Well, you say it's a battle, but 
if my brain worked normally the way things work, then I would do things a normal way. And it doesn't. So I, I my one of my skills may be finding creative solutions to things. So creative solutions to making money in business, to serving the customers better than someone else, not doing the same as everyone's always done. So it's actually a gift because if, if I thought, if I, if I could compute things normally, then I would need to do things normally, but I need to hit to have mad shortcuts. So it, I should be embarrassed, but I couldn't recite any times table. I think I can do two and four and five, but if I couldn't, I can't do my eight times table. I need to do my four and double it. So I don't know if anybody else does that, but the, the eight times table is just not a thing for me. I've mastered the four and then I double it. So um, that just makes me find solutions to things and think of things a different way. So I think rather than battling it, the one thing, the bit of advice I will share from an actual psychology professional in this is when I went for the test, and again, nobody nobody really recognised that. I believe they look for it in, in schools these days, but I went up to the Dyslexia Institute in Glasgow and the the psychologist woman was saying, and I was doing the, the test and I was like, I was getting frustrated because I was making a right, a right mess of it. And I said, oh, I'm so stupid. And it was a Glaswegian woman. She pointed at me and she said, don't you fucking say that again, that you're stupid. And I said, well, I am. I am stupid. And she says, you're just really bad at some things. And she says, don't do those things. You know the joke about I broke my arm in two places and the doctor says, don't go to those places. If you've heard that joke. <laughs> um, very similar with dyslexia. She says, right, you are... You're really you're below average at spelling, short term memory, handwriting, just don't do them. She said, but you know you're in the top half a percent of the half a percentile of the whole of Britain or the world, whatever the statistics are, for creativity and problem solving. So all you need to do is do those, but don't go into a job where you need to take notes or you need to add up numbers. Stick to what you know. So it was her that got me to look at things a bit differently. And if I can tell you a wee story now, uh, one minute. Uh, I left school with no qualifications, so I went on to get qualifications, but I get my dyslexia test halfway through an HND, so I'd done my HNC, our national certificate, and was just a shit student, barely scraped through. And when the Glasgow, Glaswegian psychologist said, you better start applying yourself, but in a positive way, rather than saying you're really shit, like my teachers had done, she says, just apply yourself solve problems with your brain rather than trying to solve them the way everyone else. And I struggled the first year, but the second year I got 15 out of 15 merits or distinctions and one student of the year and one, the, the student of the year for hospitality management the, 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 in the history of the hospitality department. And I say that not because I am smart or clever. It was the same person. It was the same person that did really badly the year before. I hadn't done any extra training. It was just simply that one lady had reprogrammed my brain to believe that I wasn't stupid, that I wasn't thick, to say, you know, something like one part of your brain is in a half a part, you're smarter than 99.5% of people for that. And I just approached it differently. So I suppose that's how I overcame it. Love it, love it. Can I just say, right, I'm, I've got dyslexia as well. And what I noticed at school is it didn't inspire me to learn or it didn't inspire me to want to learn or remember, if that makes sense. But coming into life and learning how to make money or learning how to do all the tactics or learning about business or the mindset, I've totally can learn because I've proven it in those four subjects. So, you know, for those people that are just about to start the entrepreneurship and just think where you were, like feeling shit and feeling bad about themselves, but you know there's something different where they can get where they want to be. What would your advice be to them? Well, I suppose you need to trust your instincts. So, and that is a balance. So you see people going through life that just, they ignore advice. So you're a business coach, Paula, you'll give advice to people and they'll say, great, I'm going to implement that. You'll give advice to business people and they're like, no, I know exactly what, I don't need that. And the, the, So there is a massive balance to taking advice and feedback from people that are smarter, that are professionals, that are an authority. But sometimes the best thing is just to totally ignore 
and go with your gut. So um, Emma's seen this a few times in the last month. There's times when business professionals have given us advice and it has turned out to be wrong. And you think to yourself, Blair and Alex will do this with, let's say, you know, buy to rent property, service accommodation, um, capital allowances. You could probably be arguing with a, a certain a certified accountant that's had 30 years experience and I bet you young Blair knows more about serv more about a, a specific topic about tax which would be capital allowances uh, definitely Alex does than a an accountant of 30 years or a solicitor so we can have specialist knowledge that means that actually we need to trust our gut certain experiences tell us things that when you go through university when you do the same thing you get don't mean indoctrinated that's not a word that sounds negative but if you go through life and you do the fixed systematic way of education beliefs then people do what they they've always done whereas if you can trust your gut and go for something different hey you might be wrong a lot of the time but there's a saying make a decision and make it right so trust in your instincts but not just to the point of just ignoring all the experts and people that are around about you because my 10 years at home sure I told you, I had my head down, oh, I'm going to do this myself. And it was entrepreneur's martyr syndrome. You know, every entrepreneur is a martyr. I'm working 20 hours a day and I don't need MD's help. And people relaxing, taking a holiday. That I had that martyr syndrome, it was totally stupid. Didn't take help, didn't take advice. And that's why I managed to achieve in 18 months with this business because I knew that was wrong. It took 10 years of making a very average profit to excel in 18 months why because i listen to people smarter than me so it's a paradox listen to people but ignore people makes total sense people i love that you're going with your gut as well so rather than you know the advice what's your gut telling you i love it um right so you've just hit something that i'm really passionate about so people seem to think they win a gold medal when they work 16 24 20 hours for hours a day for 400 months feel like yes i'm proud of myself what's your thoughts on that then scott well i do uh, i'm going to offend some people in the call here but your your 5 a.m club's total bullshit but so i'm getting up at 5 a.m well actually when you look at the psychology of sleep cycles some people get up early some people get up late shouldn't be forcing people to get up at 5 a.m and i bet you the people that get up at 5 a.m go to bed earlier or they have now, to, to tell people they need to get up at 5 a.m. to do stuff every day is just doesn't make sense for some people's physiology. It's just the brains and their bodies don't work that way. So I used to be like that, Paula, where I would think and the more hours you work, the more money you earn and the smarter you are and the more, you know, of a martyr. Um, so I have changed my mindset on that to work a lot harder, but in less hours. Um, I'm pretty bulletproof and they say, you know, people, oh, you need to, you're going to burn out. Well, I'll, I'll never have burn out. It's never going to happen to me, but I, I suppose it will happen to, to some people because they've got normal brains and that's what happens. But I, I'll give an example of when working hard needs to be done. This time last year, two weeks ago, and it came up in my memories, a week ago, did we go into lockdown? And Blair and Alex, we were at Edinburgh. We were shaking hands and hugging and the whole of Edinburgh, Hilton was empty. The flights were cancelled. There was nobody else there apart from us property people doing learning. Um, <laughs> so we nobody else in the world was out and about apart from us property people going to seminars. <laughs> Here, uh, my business, and we, we manage holiday homes. So we are still legally shut down. We can't, we, we shouldn't be able to make any money. And I say that we're much stronger throughout lockdown. At the start of lockdown, you can't work, you can't travel to your business, you need to self-isolate, you need to work from home. I ignored it. this office, moved into this office, lived here during the week. I did more, I sat here in the evenings to do watching the news, it's all fear mongering. So I never ever watched the news ever. So I definitely haven't watched it during lockdown. Fear mongering, anxiety, social media was a really horrible place to be. I spent my time, so finishing six at night. Well, I would spend my time listening to 
decamillionaires and billionaires in Silicon Valley, which was eight hours behind, which is why I was working to 12 at night. So the first lockdown, which was three months, I never missed one working day. I literally did not miss one Monday to Friday in this office here. I would be working to 10, 12 at night. And it's not me that saved the business. It's the amazing team across the UK that saved it. But I didn't I take a Sunday off. I'm not saying I worked all day, but every single working day, I worked 16 hour days and did lots of stuff and spent my time with rich people who had a massively different mindset to the media, to the BBC crew, to the social media, to the fear. They just saw this as opportunity. So I did work massively hard during lockdown, took a two week holiday between this time last year and this time now, took two weeks, totally switching off, but I have worked massively hard. And these type of things supercharge me. When we go back to normal and get out of lockdown, I'll just go back to being an average entrepreneur. Um, being in lockdown and the government telling us, you cannot make money in serviced accommodation. Your business needs to close. Your 12 team are going to be made redundant. Everything you've worked for up to the age of 40 is going to be taken away from you because of a government policy. I'm not going to stand for that. I'm going to work hard and I'm going to make sure that the business gets through it. So that's a long-winded answer to I work a lot, but I have the problem. I have the chance not to work if we don't want it. And it's not work. Sitting here isn't work. Talking to you, fine people, isn't work. Say I was working to half eight, nine o'clock. Well, it's not work. We're having a chat, getting to catch up with old friends, getting to make new friends. This business isn't, there's nothing here that's work at all. It's just having fun. There's dogs running about the office every day. The, the team jump up and joy every time we get the property booked when everything's in lockdown and they're getting, you know, Emma got a, a booking and it was like 32,000 pounds for a year. No other company in our sector was getting it. They shut off, they're sitting watching Netflix. They're not doing anything. They're messing about, their calendars are shut. But one of our team, is getting a 32,000 pound booking for a whole year with 100% occupancy when the big companies and other companies shut their doors and pissed about. So there's none of that work. Sorry, I got carried away. I was getting right passionate. Oh, I love this. I absolutely love this. Before I th I've got loads of questions, by the way, Scott. We are going to like two in the morning. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Only four hours left. <laughs> <laughs> um, just checking on Margaret. Margaret, do you have any questions for Scott? Um, I'm probably curious, given what you said about your your background and upbringing, what drove you to get into property management? What what was the trigger for that? So um, I think I think Blair and Alex heard that story probably this time last year. Um, it was nice and simple actually. Um, so property wasn't something my family did or anything, but my my dad. Uh, it was in Manchester, so much like English. Um, so, in case there's any English watching and you know, it's prejudiced against Scottish, but I'm I wonder who's out here. <laughs> I'm bisexual when it comes to you know, current countries. So, I'd go and see my dad once a year, and I'd go to, I'd go to, I'd go to Manchester as a young kid, and you know, living the life I did with my mum, I used to love going to see my dad, and I'd be a young kid, and it just. And a Saturday before he went to the pub, my dad had a drink problem as well too, but was a mad worker with it. But my dad just took me around and I'd be a little, a little high hold my dad's hand. And I remember everybody laughing at my dad because I don't know what he did at the time, a delivery driver, but he had, he had properties. And the, the guys were giving him a ribbon in the pub saying, ah, oh, well, you've got these you've got all these properties and why do you need all these properties? And I asked my dad, dad, why, why were they making fun of you? And it's nice and simple. And what I'm going to tell you now, people have made millions of pounds selling courses on. So there are seminars and Blair and us. Well, I'll tell you the story. There's people made, there's people millionaires offer the, what I'm going to give you this bit of advice, this, this story now. My dad took me around and I had this, holding his hand. He said, Scott, let's go and visit the properties. See that property there? That pays for all my holidays. So I don't need to touch my wages because that income from that property pays all my holidays. I go three holidays a year. Mm. Walked away to the next place. That there pays all my food and all my household bills. So I don't need to touch my wages. That property 
that sweet old couple gave me my rent money, cash every every Saturday as they did back there in the early eighties or late eighties. Uh, that pays for all my food. That pays my beer money, Scott. So that's my beer money. So uh, he's the most excited. He does the care about holidays or food, but that pays his beer money. And the last one paid his mortgage. So my dad wasn't a sophisticated buy to let investor, but this day and age, you know, if I had if I had to fall in hard times, I just get a stage and tell that story about how buy to let can make you financially free and cash flow and blah, 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 and you can retire at whatever age. But my dad wasn't a sophisticated buy to let investor by any means. He just, he thought, because he was a wheeler dealer, he thought, oh, well, how do I get free beer money? How do I drink for free? Oh, I'll get a property and the, the rent money will cover the mortgage and I'll keep the difference. So that told me, and the one influence my dad did have as he said, Scott, you need to get into property. I don't care how you do it. Don't worry about how you do it. Just get into property. So, Margaret, to answer your story, I joined the Navy at 16 to get away from all that shit. I was at sea, so I could buy a house um, because I had money. And I, I remember going for the loan and he said, how much is the house worth? And it, it was 12,200 12, quid back in 1998. And the guy said, there's a loan. He gave me a loan because I was in the Navy. So I didn't even need a mortgage. He just said, there's there's a loan for 12200 Bought that house and sold it three years later for 62 and a half. So I instantly made wow. £50,000. So that was my first thing into property. But I realised that, that... So I bought another buy to let with that. But then I ran out of money, Margaret. And I thought, mm -hmm. I've got these houses, but I don't really have an income how do I how do I use property when I don't have any money? And I still had that poverty mindset. So going and earning money wasn't, I think, so I was, I was struggling and I thought, well, actually I can leverage other people's, and again, it wasn't sophisticated. I could probably teach this and people would say, that's amazing. And it would get Instagram quotes. But back then I was just stumbled across this. I don't have money. I don't have qualifications. Nobody, I'm never going to get, mortgages because i'm always going to be there what can i do to make money at property and i thought if i can help people like margaret and i can do a better job than the letting agent did for me i can take 10 percent of that money and then i can get 10 percent and 5 10 20 30 100 of those and as long as i do a good job better than other agents in our ethical i'm giving them 10 percent value they're giving me 10 percent of their profit but they're taking the mortgage, they've got you know, negative equity risks, they're putting their savings in to get the deposit, um, they need to pay the repairs if a tenant trashes it then, or there's a, a rental gap, they take the risk. All I need to do is put the time and the passion into it. So that's why I went into management and it's why I love it as a business model. Again, we, I could buy properties, but I'd need to put my own money in. Mm -hmm. Lots of things can happen and it's a good business model, but mine for me, property management, um, and being commission only. So that's what I love and it's why the team works well. And if we got a chance to cover it, perhaps it's another question later, but being commission only allows us to just link our value to the money that we get for that. Thank you. So Scott, thanks for that, Margaret. So Scott, I've got to go in for the commission only question. Tell me more. Well, and I don't know if any of my employed team will be here, but and it's nothing against the employed team by any means because they're amazing as well. And these, but moving forward, for me, there's a there's a massive difference between the what we do. So our business model is commission only. So it's not like we're a solicitor on retainer or something. It's just simply commission. Depends on the service between ten and twenty percent. We will take that of the money that we generate. So Emma is one of, of our team. She'll go and provide management services and the owners don't need to do anything. So it's nice and simple. Give us your property and retire. Go hiking, little, little Himalayas, do whatever you want. So for me, our value to the owner, we don't make money if they don't make money. And so that has always worked for us for the last, since 2005. The commission only model, meaning if we don't get a tenant in, we don't make money. If that tenant doesn't pay the rent, we put a bad tenant in, costs us money, but we don't make money and the, the landlord hates us. So it's massively incentivized to do the best thing, be most efficient use of your time, because you need to be great with your timekeeping to manage more properties. So it just works. 
the, the, the big secret to this is why I love this business so much and the team do so fantastically well. I just speak on things like this. All the team do the work. It's, uh, I just, I, I'm just the face of it, but the team do the amazing things. But if we can remunerate the team linked to the success of the properties, then I know they work harder. And let's take the example. I'm not going to, it's not another property management company, but just a random property management company. The business model for companies like Pillow and there's some big national players there. They just have a big call, a big office call center. When they get more properties, bang on a desk, bang on a phone, and a new staff member. By the way, it's the easiest business model to manage because you just have a big, massive office. Everybody can be trained and kept an eye on. And, you know, it's, it's easy. It's the easiest business model. But if we can have commission only people all across the UK who live and work in their area, we can help them be entrepreneurs and business people. Then they're more emotionally invested to us. The, their performance isn't 95. So if you phone the big call center for your property as an landlord or a guest, you get through to somebody who's never seen your property, who doesn't care. Do they care if it's let? They're on a salary. They're finishing at five. If you phone up at five past five, you get an answer phone, you don't get an answer till Monday morning. They don't care. If the property's empty, they get, they get a salary. So for me, I thought, well, what if we changed what the industry were? What if we didn't have a call center? And the bigger we got just meant we had more people working from home, which actually turned out to be great because of COVID. So all companies were, we were fine because it's like, well, we do this anyway. A couple of, a couple of the team went home here at HQ, but everybody was working from home anyway. So everybody's massive disruption and businesses destroyed because team had to go home. A lot of the team was set up where Emma is, is there was no difference between lockdown and, and lockdown out, lockdown for your working environment. So the commission only, I think, works well. I love the team that are salaried. I know if I take a property manager sitting here that has a salary and one that is on commission only, the commission only one will perform massively better. It takes a lot, it takes it takes a lot of bottles and balls to be commission only in this, this game because the guys were commission only. If they were salaried, they would have been in follow. And they would get 80% or the ones that were in follow got 100% of their wages. But the commission only, Emma, if you don't mind me sharing, you were commission only during lockdown. You still made a lot of money during lockdown, but you shouldn't have done because the business was, the government stopped it. But as a salary, a salaried person on 80% money on any company sitting at home, not doing anything versus somebody in commission only that's working hard during lockdown to fill the landlord's properties to get them earning money to stop them going bankrupt. It just worked. And despite having lost, I think maybe 750 to a million pounds of potential income during lockdown, that's, this has been the making of us and it proved the business model works. Wow. It goes, it goes to show, um, salaried people are there for a reason and I love them, but even in my business, I can't do salaried people. It's got to be, um, self-employed or business owners to work with us as you know employees not as employees but who support us and outsource us because otherwise they won't know what it feels like to be self-employed so if i had a coach coaching and they're getting paid as a salary they won't know the game yeah. so i totally get that i, I really there's love some, that some positions you can't really you know if you, sales people you can put in commission but there's some jobs you can and there's some people that don't because hey the bills they pay and um, one of our teams just having twins and i'd never want to put her in commission only because she's getting twins she's going to bring them into the office we have would i'd never want to get her to go commission only because she needs to make money for her twins and she doesn't want the stress or fluctuating income so we can support both but the the commission works and moving forward i think it, the commission only is the after lockdown and this proves the model. Yeah, I love it when they back themselves. Love it, commission only. Back, he's actually saying to the boss, I'm backing myself in making the cash. Love that, love that. Okay, uh, Andrew, do you have any questions? I actually have one in regards to when you joined the Navy. Um, mm -hmm. You left an environment that was a lot different to what the Navy would have been. So. How did you feel when you first initially joined the Navy and the changes that happened there? And then when you came back after that first year to your original hometown, what was the differences in your attitude, your mindset then and then when you came back? Uh, that's an amazing question and a question I don't think I've ever been asked before. So um, this is a brand new question. The answer to the first part of that, Andrew, is 
it put me into an environment that you know, joined the Navy, you're as militant, you're told to be at a place at a time, you're getting beasted for fitness. But it turned out that when we were in that environment, I was 16, I was the youngest person in the basic training. Everybody else was adults in their 20s, so I was by far the youngest, but it turned out that the situation flipped. There was, it was for adults in their 20s that had had a nice upbringing, it was a horrible environment. They were getting shouted at, you'd make the bed, it would get flung up, you would get fitness every day, you would get told you're a piece of shit. There was, every night I'd go to bed hearing grown men crying, and I was giggling to myself, because they were like, why is this not fucking you up? And I'm like, this guy shouting at me is nothing compared to my mom coming home drunk, telling me you're a piece of shit, you'll never achieve anything. This is just a guy. That's nothing. Him, they were like, I said, food's horrible. I'm like, I'm getting three meals a day for the first time in my life. They're like, that's the worst food I've ever tasted. I was like, this is the best food I've ever tasted. <laughs> they were like, I have a fucking stupid uniform. I'm like, it doesn't smell. I don't have, I don't have holes in it. So it flipped where I was... And the, for the first time, had structure, had people there, had people like, trying to train you and mentoring you, bring the best out. I had friends that weren't fucking breaking into factories and taking drugs. So it, it broke a lot of people and people dropped out of basic training. But for me, starting there, it, it, I mean, I loved it. So <laughs> I was in a good position in the Navy. Now, it turns out I had a problem taking orders. Who would have thought that? I had a problem with authority. So <laughs> I left five years later. But those, the, I have fond memories of that initial training simply because people that hadn't experienced any negative things in their life left a nice, kind of comfortable, normal life to go and get shouted at and made to do press ups and, you know, hit with sticks and run through assault courses. I loved it. I get fit. I, I get healthy because I had food for the first time properly. And um, people were there, were part of your family. So that part was great coming back. And guys, for anybody that's, been away on travels and then come back to Scotland or any any city or small village in the UK and you see people and you look differently because there's people you guys will know that have never ever been out of the village that you're sitting in now or the town you're sitting in now and they think that's it they don't realize there's different cultures and different languages and in the navy I got to go to Rio de Janeiro the Falklands Argentina uh, Greece Uruguay you know Spain France all these places and then you come back and as a young kid, and they say it makes a man of you, whether you go to the army or the RAF, it makes a man of you because you need to go from zero to ironing your own gear, being self-sufficient, going away in a ship for six months and not, you know, you had to, you, you learnt these skills. But when you come back, you just felt a little bit alien. So you were just, I'll, what I, I still feel alien now in every environment I go in. But then I come back and I thought, I'm just... And then it's not better because you see people leaving the armed forces and they've got the armed forces attitude of like uh, stupid civvies and they have the, the forces slang. That's like an arrogance you get from being in so many years and you, you lose a bit of percent, you know, you don't, you lose a bit of reality because you see things for 22 years, which is a standard term in the forces, you see things a certain way. But I did five and I get out before that, but seeing, seeing the people that you used to look up to seeing the people that used to bully you, you think, well, how did that ever happen? You know, it just changes your, your mind totally. Thank you. Wow, Scott, that's just absolutely brilliant. Uh, right, cheeky question, because I'm just mindful of your time. No, um, I'm not single. <laughs> well, I'm your mistress, I don't know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry, Emma. <laughs> right, Silicon Valley. Yes. Tell me what it was like to work with Facebook and what well, you went to Facebook and YouTube and all that. Um, there was a really good story as well, wasn't there, where, where, about a boardroom mm. uh, that you saw. Could you tell us more? So if I had to say to you guys, listen, I've been over to Silicon Valley and Facebook and LinkedIn and Apple. That all sounds quite glamorous and if I had said that story at the start, right, Paul, I said, there's amazing Scott, he's so amazing and sexy and amazing, then, and, and he's been to Silicon Valley. If you'd asked that question at the start and people would say, oh, wow, he's amazing, he's been to Silicon Valley. But now that you know a little bit about me, we blagged that trip to Silicon Valley. The two, blagged two trips to Silicon Valley. One, we won in a pitching competition. And the second one, we, I hope the Scottish government aren't watching, but the, um, 
<laughs> Scottish government paid for me to go. So um, my own taxis paid for me to go. So they funded it. So um, it was quite surreal to be jumping out from the west coast of Scotland, the Ayrshire, and the next thing you know, you're in the middle of Silicon Valley and you're seeing all these big tech companies, you're visiting Apple. So you're sitting on Apple's campus, you literally in LinkedIn. And it was just, I think at the start, it was the start of this month last year, just as we were flying back, the flights get canceled because of COVID and all this nonsense. So just over a year ago, we were there. So it's surreal to go from just cutting about Scotland, being a businessman, just, you know, having fun. And then you're sitting in Apple, you're sitting in LinkedIn, you're, you're literally in Facebook, you're sitting in, if everybody wanted to see, I'll not talk about it too much, but check Facebook, I'm sitting in Facebook and eating lunch and you just go and it's like a little community. If you walk up Buchanan Street, for example, uh, or any high street and there's a hairdresser and a shop and a ice cream shop, that was like Facebook's campus. It was just all the buildings and then in the middle and it was the guy that, that gave, gave the tour. Do you want lunch? No. Okay, we'll go for lunch. I'm going into your shop. And I said, how much is it? How do I pay? Like, he says, you don't pay. You don't pay for anything at Facebook. You could go and get an ice cream. And it's American. So when you get an ice cream, you don't get an ice cream. You get an ice cream. <laughs> you get everything on it. Uh, so we just sit and having big, massive plates. And it was such an amazing experience. But the, the Americans are massively different to people in the UK and especially people in Scotland. So the main thing, yeah, you're seeing all these places and different countries, all the companies you hear about, you're literally going and seeing them, but they have a massively different way of looking at things. So in Scotland, they, you know, they, they don't want you doing too well. Even people don't like that when you're doing too well. Well, that that guy will fall on his ass or he must be doing something wrong. Whereas in America, the genuinely people in Silicon Valley are, are, are rooting for you. If you fail in Scotland, then everybody sniggers and say, well, I knew he'd fail. They don't, they, they kind of want you to. It's, it's a horrible thing sometimes, but in America, they don't see it as a problem. In fact, if, you, if I go to America, they see it as negative that I haven't failed in business. And Scotland says, oh, you've not failed. You're doing well. Cool. But in America, if you wanted to get investment and we were got offers of $2 million and things, hello, Alfie, then the fact that I hadn't failed was a negative to them because they'd say, well, you don't know how it feels. You've never failed and then risen. So they see that as part of your natural learning journey. Fail forward fast, I believe, is the term. Yeah. Okay. So let me ask you a question. So you you've gone for a, an award in Scotland, and they say you're far too ambitious. You go and pitch in America, and they say what to you? Uh, the opposite. You're not ambitious enough. So the first time I went to Silicon Valley, um, I gave them my story, and again, I'm at Silicon Valley Bank is one of these places, and then the next place was. The deal, the offices of the, so overlooking the bridge and Alcatraz, I'm sitting in the offices and check Facebook. So Alcatraz is in the background in, in San Francisco. And it was a solicitor's and I thought, oh, solicitor's a law firm. And I said, what's the biggest deal you've ever done? This, what, what's the biggest deal you've ever done here? And they said, oh, this is where Microsoft acquired LinkedIn. Where you guys are sitting is where they signed the actual papers and I forget, you guys may know about 19 billion pounds or whatever. It was a, a massive amount of money with a lot of zeros. And we're sit I'm sitting in the office about to pitch. And they had just, the last deal they did there was where Microsoft bought LinkedIn for billions and billions of dollars. And I had my big, mad, ambitious plan that people in Scotland said, well, that's too big. You're just, you Emma, what was the term they used? Was it, you're trying to boil the ocean. You're too big, you're trying to boil the ocean. Whereas and I went and did that and I thought, well, it's America. So I'm not, I got a bit of advice saying how you need to, don't, don't play yourself down, be ambitious. So I, I went with the same plan and I thought I'll be cheeky and stick a zero on that. So I'll, I'll add a zero in the end to what Scotland said that was too ambitious, but I'll put a zero. And they just looked and said, you've got a great business, but nobody's going to be interested. Nobody wants a 30 million pound business. We want to be investing in something that's going to be a 300 million. So I had these plans to make Palo, I think, 10 exit. So we're maybe worth 3 million or something, whatever. 
uh, but I put on zero at the end and said, well, we've got a well, 30 million pound plan. So our 30 million pound plan, they just laughed at and said, unless you're coming here with a three, 300 million pound business in the next few years, uh, you're wasting people's time. Needless to say, I went back the next year and had my 300 million pound business plan. So, um, and luckily we could have got a couple of million dollars investment but we would have needed to move the business. One of the parts of the deal was we'd need to move to Silicon Valley. And if you follow what's happening in California now, California is the worst place in the world to be. You'd be better off in North Korea <laughs> or arguably Scotland. They're very similar when it comes to stuff these days, but you'd be better in North Korea. You'd have more freedom and less tax. So California is one of the worst places in America for tax and freedoms. It's, it's turned horrific. When you look at Miami, who's totally open and free, and COVID is not a thing in Miami, but apparently it's a thing in California. So total lockdown, authoritarianism, it'd be the worst place for us. And I knew then that there's no way that I would want to take the business and headquarter it in Silicon Valley. I'm happy in Scotland, thank you. I think you're playing safe at 300 million anyway, to be fair. Yen, maybe. 600. <laughs> Right, now I've heard rumours about you, and this could, could be a bit controversial, but I've been hearing you becoming residents of different countries. Uh, yes. Oh. Uh, so, uh, top marks, if anybody can tell me that flag, and here's my residency ID card, I will cover it. Oh, my God. Who knows, guys? Who knows this? So that is a that is a country called Lieberland. Nobody's heard of it. Now it is a special country, and it's Lieber for liberty. And it's a little country. It's tiny. It's like seven kilometers by seven kilometers square, in between Serbia and Croatia. And somebody noticed that this strip of land became unclaimed for hundreds of years. And libertarians, the opposite of Sorry to offend any socialists or communists in the audience, but it's the opposite of communism. It's libertarianism. It's a country that's constitution was written for freedom. So uh, live and let live is a national motto. So the Free Republic of Lieberland, you can check Lieberland. So um, once I heard of this, I had to go and get residency there and it was just an amazing the constitution is worth looking at it's essentially the opposite of the uk the government don't interfere they don't you don't get taxed you you get in if you can contribute something to the society so obviously you might guess i don't like just being a citizen i want to be part of it so we're trying to get pillow to be the the tourist company that drives tourism there and manages the property uh, and i also a citizen of croatia and I'm going down, I, I should be going down to the Croatian, sorry, Estonia. Estonia, that's coming next. So uh, Estonia, <laughs> there you go, uh, Lieberland. Uh, somebody's putting in the chat, well done, thanks, Brian. I nice see you. Um, so one of the best countries in Europe for digital e-residency is Estonia. They make it very easy. So my card is sitting in London, can't... Can't, can't travel at the moment. Um, so as soon as we're allowed, I'm going down to get my residency for there. Fab. Should be going to Dubai in March to do that. So that's setting the business up in Dubai. And there's just so many other amazing places. Um, I don't have the book. There's a great book, Andrew Henderson. It's called Nomad Capitalist. Andrew Henderson, Nomad Capitalist. And he's trademarked us now. Go where you are treated the best. So when Scotland are... When the UK, sorry, put corporation tax up 5%, well, you know what, you go to Bahrain and you pay 0% corporation tax, you set up a subsidiary in the Canary Islands and pay 4% total. So go where you're treated the best is an amazing thing. Read the book, check out his podcast, and it's just, why would you go somewhere, like our industry, for example, and the, the team will know this, Edinburgh. Edinburgh detests short-term letting, so why would I want to... Why would I fight Edinburgh City Council and the Scottish government who want to regulate it when we could go to the Canary Islands? They'll say, well, we love it so much. We'll give you 4% corporation tax. We'll give you IP boxes. We want you to come here and stimulate the economy and get employment. And they would welcome us with open arms. So not to be negative about Scotland, because I think Scotland is an amazing place 
to be an entrepreneur. It's been so kind to us. The support is they still support us. I'm not been negative against the Scottish business ecosystem or entrepreneurship ecosystem. It's amazing and it has so many elements that England and Wales don't have. And again, I say that totally impartially. It's not that Scotland's amazing. There's things Scotland aren't as good as, but for startup businesses, it, it's pretty cool and it's pretty up there. <laughs> so let me ask you one last question on this then. Where do you see Pillow is going to be in three to five years' time? So three years' time, we we have a nice growth strategy. So as I'll charted out and I spend a lot of time looking at that. So we're definitely going to have a hundred million pounds UK valuation, being fifty comp countries, hundreds of thousands of properties, and you can see Emma on the screen. I'm going to have Emma's all over the world, and they are going to be building their perfect lives and they're going to be helping their owners get their perfect lives by maximizing their income. So oh, nice, God. nice, clear, charted out path. I need to pitch a lot of times to American people. So pitching and telling where we're going to be uh, in three years, I could tell you to the day how that plan's going to pay out. So when you pitch then, Scott, what is the outcome you want to when you're pitching? What is it you want to attract? It depends who's there, but one of our... At the start of lockdown, we didn't know what was going to happen, and we still don't know if we're ever going to get out of lockdown. And what we noticed in Silicon Valley was the business startup ecosystem in Silicon Valley is, hey, I've got an idea. It's an app. It's not made. It's just an idea. And then that business is worth $3 million. And then they, they raise a million dollars to get it off the ground. And for example, Uber doesn't make money and never has and probably never will until they get driverless cars. We work, when, I, when we were in Silicon Valley the last time, we work was just about to go bust, but it got sold, it IPO'd, so initial, initial public offering for, I don't know, 35 billion. So it was, it was going to go bankrupt, and if it didn't raise money from us buying shares in it, it then put the valuation to, I don't know, billions, 30 odd billion. Airbnb was valued at, four, and everybody knows Airbnb, it was valued at 46 billion. It, gave its initial public offering and went to 90 odd. So that doubled in value overnight. So that's how business works there. You don't need to be in profit for the first seven years. People would buy into your business. So for us, if we could not, we don't need to now because the amazing team like Emma were building the business organically, bootstrapping it. We don't need to give equity or sell the business, but we could sell 20% of our business to get millions and millions in, which would allow us to then expand faster, do things, get the best talent in the world, build the best platform. But it so happens that we were going to do that before lockdown, but with everybody up in their game, with everybody buying, because everybody within the business has the same crazy mind as me, rightly or wrongly. But at the start of lockdown, we came together and we all said, we're not letting this, we are going to make this business stronger. We are going to come out at the end of this with more properties, with more income. We've all come out stronger, the self, the self, what do you call it, commission-based team as well. So we've come out stronger and actually had this not happened to us and we've lost potential income of nearly a million pounds, but it's just made the business, the foundations of it better. It's made us more resilient and it's made our options even bigger. So we don't need to have that investment to survive. And you guys, you'll hear the word runway. What do you have in the bank? If you don't make money, what's your runway? If you've got bills and before lockdown, we had nearly 50,000 pounds a month of expenses every month to run the business payroll everything and we needed to make fifty thousand pounds a month to break even or just less than that so if we didn't make money we, we didn't have fifty thousand pounds in the bank or we did have 50 so we had two months runway but now we have infinite runway because we made profit every month during lockdown despite our industry being totally closed but and that's testament to the team and their hard work because i don't make the money they all go and manage the properties and make the money so it's a hundred percent down to the team that we don't need investment. We can go organically. Somebody's got a spare two million and wants to join the team, then perhaps you could. There might be a little slice, but we don't need it. Shall we it's ask Blair? Blair, Alex? Not at the moment. No, maybe in five years, come back to you. Are you playing too? Maybe we got a million at the moment. <laughs> um, I've got loads of questions. Honestly, I have. I could go on all day with you, Scott. You're fascinating. Um, I'm just mindful of people's time. Emma, Brian, Fiona, do you have any questions, guys? 
I think you covered nearly every single question I had. Just as I wrote it down, you kept asking it. Um, I think the one of the biggest things for me is, is that difference between the, the Silicon Valley. So see when you got the ITV, when you got that and you got to Silicon Valley, that was a massive pivotal point in your journey that I know of. So just even if you can talk us through just a little bit more about how monumental that one event was and what you had to do for that. Yeah, so... Emma was in the audience for that event and it was the Startup Summit, was it 2018, I think? And there was loads of things. And I like to apply for things. So I, I like to put pillow forward for everything is, that we can. Um, it was a Startup Summit and it was for tech companies. And basically you get through various rounds. And I never thought we'd get through because when I went to, we got through to the semifinals. And I was sitting to the guy waiting in the waiting room before we go up to Edinburgh to pitch in front of the solicitors and the, the venture capitalists. And the guy's like, oh, no, I, I do, you know, I do security systems. And I thought, oh, fucking guy's got a security company. But no, he did robots that went around the perimeter, like Terminator type Skynet stuff. And I thought, I'm never, I've got a property management company. There's no way I could beat that. And the other people were helping cure diabetes and medical records and, you know, all these cool things. So we goes up to Edinburgh and I says, Eva, we need to go up to Edinburgh. I'm pitching at this thing. And there was three finalists. One was Pillow, who did property management. Remember, it's a tech, it's a tech uh, competition. The other, so the two people went up first. And the first guy, who was an amazing young guy. Hi, um, I'm my tech uh, helps people with dyslexia present and he had a tablet and his business was helping people with dyslexia do professional presentations. So as you might imagine, he was good at presenting uh, and was amazing and was helping people with dyslexia. So a, a good, a, we do property management that doesn't really have a social purpose or has no tech to it. Next person was Debbie, who went up and said, hi, I'm single-handedly curing diabetes, who nailed a presentation. The audience were wowing uh, and hot up, helped you know, My Way Digital Health, and Debbie's an amazing, she's a scientist and a PhD, I think, she's very clever, and had made this medical app, and she said 95% of the local authority NHS users were going all over the world, and then I was last, and Emma was looking at me, and I'm like, that is a tough, that is a tough performance to, to how, do we, how do we compete against that? And anyway, we went up, and I just thought, well, I can only do, I've got three minutes, I need to memorise it, so it wasn't look. I had to memorize it. I had to nail it perfectly. And it just worked. So the three minutes, I did my part. I went up. I, I did my part that I had done. And I had, how many times did I practice that, Emma? I can tell you I practiced that more than 10 times the cumulative times the other people practice. Because I'm shit, I can't remember three minutes. I, I can't remember what I did this morning. Never mind a three-minute speech to nail in front of three, four hundred people on a live TV. So we did that. Then it came to the questions, and yeah, I had researched who the people were. So again, it's my dyslexia. If I was smart and clever, I would just go up and wing it. But I did. I had to research exactly who those people were, what they did, and then I formulated what questions they would ask me. So one was a venture capitalist, one was a guy that was a commercial director for STV. So his was going to be focused on if you won the advertising, how would that benefit your business? And I followed them on Twitter and stalked them for three weeks and wrote down every single question that those guys could ask so that I would never get caught out. And that was the dyslexia, the, the scruffy, mud, muddled up brain that thought, I can't, I can't win this unless I can do deliver my pitch better and practice 10 times more than anybody else. If I really drill down and find out who these people are, what's their pain points, what's their passion points, what answers can I give them that would resonate to get them to pick me? And Emma, you can tell the part, nobody expected us to win. Everybody's like, De Debbie Wake is going to win that. Yeah, absolutely. And it was quite funny because when they were going on to the, and I'm sitting there and obviously believing in pillow as well, and, and that's my thing, but I'd watched Debbie who nailed her pitch. And at the end of the day, it was a pitching and tech competition. There was two parts to it. She nailed it. She had the most amazing tech. And we're sitting there and we're waiting for the winner to be announced. And then they said pillow and Scott. And we literally just looked at each other. And then I glanced over at Debbie, who's like that, what? <laughs> you see her face as if like that shouldn't happen. But Scott delivered the best pitch uh, with the most passion, the most honest, and he answered and researched his questions, and it was his preparation 
in his pitch that won that for him? Well, that yes, some of that. But remember, we were Pillow was very modest. We answered questions and says, well, we're not actually a tech company. Um, we brought the team into it. So you were in the audience. So it was partially you that won it because I brought you into it and says, well, it isn't actually, we don't, it isn't about tech. You can have the best tech in the world, but it's amazing people like Emma who are the, you, tech doesn't solve problems. It's just dumb tech. You need people at the end of that. So we have less tech, but more amazing people. And we bring, so we brought the team into it, highlighted Emma. So I can't take the credit for it. Um, it was the business structure and, by highlighting Emma in the crowd and putting her on the spot, they thought, well, tech's tech, you can invent, but it needs to be people like Emma at the end of that tech, otherwise you don't have a business. So it was the modesty of not knowing all the, you know, being honest about, hey, we're not a tech company, I've, but why would we be? Because it doesn't make sense when we can use the world's best tech. So why would we try and beat Microsoft? Why would we try and beat Google when we could use that and then do the core thing better? And just get people like Emma to use that. So it was the team that won us that, really. You make me laugh, Scott, because every time I've seen you, I've known you, what, a couple of years now, three years? It's always Scott Weir Award, Scott Weir Award, Pillow, Pillow. It's always, you're always up to something or you're always getting a grant type of thing. Yeah, but you don't see all the things I don't get because I'm don't. i never on social media. I, say, I stay away from it. I don't say... Oh, look how I failed today. Uh, I, you only see the good things. It's it's confirmation bias. But I love it because it really inspires me. And I think, how did you get to know about that bloody grant? Like, where do you get to know all this? Well, one of the things, in fact, I get the email before this and we had applied for a Portuguese accelerator program. Uh, we didn't get in it, actually. And you knew I was waiting for this. So last week, I should have known last Tuesday uh, and we didn't fit, but... I mean, we get into so many things that we shouldn't just because we apply and you think, I like your passion and I like, you do. I've did a degree and an MBA and then done loads of business seminars and teaching and the Scottish government's paid for us to go on leadership courses. And in every single class I sit there thinking, I'm the opposite of what business books teach about management and leadership. I'm the opposite. And at the start, I thought my, my, my degree was still cleaning. I had a cleaning company back then. I was cleaning carpets because I couldn't, didn't know what to do. And at that point in time was working for the NHS because I left the Navy with no qualifications. So I couldn't do a job. Nobody, I was unemployable. So all I could do was clean old people's shit. And that's what I did seven days a week. I worked in the nursing home at the weekend and worked for the NHS. So I went to college to do my HNC and D, finished at four, then went to an NHS old person's hospital to clean the toilets, basically, because that's what I did. Uh, and I did that for years while paying my way through uni. But I'd sat in that management course when I started to degree with imposter syndrome, thinking I don't deserve to be on a management degree because all these people are smart and coming out with you know, leadership theories, and I, I'm doing the opposite. I'm doing everything wrong. But trusting your gut and saying, well, maybe that's the way they've always done it. But perhaps that's not right for this business in this time with the culture. And some of that has proved wrong, and but most of it has proved to be right for this business. So I, I've felt out of place in all these business and leadership things. And if you'd write a book, I'd be doing the opposite. So... It just it sometimes the things we go for is get in where you fit in. We we're not going to be the suit and tie formal business type things. We are going to be the ragtag underdogs that just happen to to win things we shouldn't and upset things. But we we're not going to apply for the the formal things. If that makes sense. Totally. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay, imposter syndrome then. I've got to ask this. I know we're at the end of the time, but there's a, quite a lot of people that I know experience imposter syndrome. What's your one biggest secret to beating that? And I'll be blunt, realising that everybody else is assholes in the room. <laughs> so who's, if you guys have been to business networking, right, and I know Blair would have been back in the day when you went into the room, my first time I went, went into a BNI meeting and you'll know the BNI but I back in air and I remember being terrified sitting in the car to one minute running in sitting and 
hearing everybody's 60 second pitch and your first couple of meetings at any network and you don't hear the five pitches before you you're sitting terrified you don't hear what they're saying because you think what am I going to say what am I going to say what if I stand up and forget my words everybody's going to laugh at me oh no it's coming closer it's coming closer I forgot what I'm going to say I don't even know my business I don't know my name and you start the adrenaline goes and then you stand up and you sit down and say I, I said too many ums or I forgot and everybody's laughing at me nobody's going to refer and then when you go back a few years later you think why was I scared to talk in front of that guy? He's an ass. It's just imposter syndrome's made up. You just it's your nerves. It's living from fear. And there's an old saying, if you've heard this, and I'll finish in this analogy, it's a Indian, an Indian chief, not the not the the Indians from America. And it was, you know how they're all mystical and stuff. And there was a young guy and the old chief who was very knowledgeable. And the guy said um, to the shaman, the old guy, the young thing said, you know, chief, I'm constantly fighting a battle here. And there's two things happening in my head. There's two voices. There's one that I should live with courage and be courageous and a hero. But the other one is fearful. And it's like there's two dogs in my brain fighting for dominance. There's the courage dog and the fear dog. And he said, but what one will win? And the old shaman says, the one that you feed. And I heard that years ago and thought a lot of shite, well, a lot of rubbish. <laughs> but then I heard that again and I thought it's so true. It's what we feed, it's what we think about, it's what we give the attention to. And if we feed the fear dog, it's gonna get bigger, it's gonna get stronger, it'll be dominant. But if we feed the courage dog every day and we, we take that decision when we're faced with that decision, it's surprising just how different the day can be if you feed the courage dog rather than the fear dog. That might make no sense. It didn't the oh, first time I heard it, but then I heard it again. I thought, that's brilliant. No, so, I, love it. I can see Margaret loving that straight away. Look at her making notes. Love it, love it, love it. Right, Brian, Fiona, any questions? Similar to Emma, I had loads of questions and then Paula with a big mouth ended up asking them. <laughs> so, no. That's a get out, isn't it? I just want to ask, oh. can I just ask one thing, Scott? It was brilliant. Thanks so much. What would you do if you had to do something different? What would you do differently? I thought you'd go back in time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. I would definitely go back to being 12, 13, and I wouldn't be concerned by the things that I'm concerned about. I mean, uh, I was scared to make eye contact with people. I was scared to speak. Um, I was scared to try hard at school because I thought I was stupid, but I was still the same person, but I was definitely feeding the fear dog. So I, to follow on from that, I would do everything the same, but with courage. And I probably wouldn't do, somebody put nothing low and I'm like, well, I probably wouldn't. I'd probably still join the Navy because that was right for me at that time. But imagine if I'd joined the Navy and didn't go in the piss and miss the ship sailing from the Falklands and it's gone back to the UK 8,000 miles away. I could have had a much better glorious Royal Navy career if I had uh, not went drinking all the time and, and missed the ship and not had a problem with authority. So I'd, I'd still probably do that. I'd still probably lead to the journey. I'd just make better decisions and um, I would still end up where I am, but it took, it probably took me, a, it took me 16, 10 to 12 years to reprogram all the shit out my brain from when I was younger. So I would just reprogram that faster by living with courage rather than being in fear. And that's a horrible place to be. I mean, just going down the street terrified, just thinking, this, did people just cross the street to bully me and shout at me and look at me? And people weren't looking at me. I probably, they, weren't, they didn't even notice me, but I just had that fear. So it took me, 15 years to get rid of all those things and I had my four goals of making sure I get rid of all my my fears and you know the one thing we haven't touched on is the self-defense aspect which is the big part for me is I didn't want to live in fear and I said at 15 I am going to do I'm going to dedicate my life not to live in fear 
and then went on, studied martial arts, did taekwondo, became a black belt in that, did kickboxing, bit of Muay Thai, found Krav Maga, which is Israeli, and went to Israel to spe- train with the special forces, dedicated five, six years of my life to training as much as that. And then not just learning to master it for my own good, then teaching self-defense seminars, lots of women's seminars, and obviously the Sarah Everett thing. We did lots of female self-defense, self-defense seminars, classes, and taking people that were where I was back when I was a teenager and catching them and then making them confident. And Emma's been to a few of those seminars. We go in and there'd be females there that get dragged along or didn't know what they were going into. And they'd kick me in the balls, they'd just punch me, slap me in the face, I'd a groin guard and a head guard, they'd to fight, they'd to scream, they'd to swear. And they hated it. And in the first couple of minutes, they were terrified. And then in that three hour seminar there, they left warrior princesses, being able to identify the situation of situational awareness, being able to express themselves, stay back, being confident, making eye contact, a strong voice, an arm out to defend their space rather than not looking up like I never used to. So being able to defend yourself and fight is good. That's cool. You can do fancy gun disarms and knives and fight five people. That's just fancy shite. But being able to teach that to people that need it is the real skill there. So not just women but guys as well so another topic i'm passionate about that i'll not start rattling on about (laughs) well scott i'm fascinated with you and i was wondering if i can invite you back in a couple of weeks time talk about the mindset and and the the martial arts type of thing if you're okay with that well if people get get the feedback if if people would find it interesting i'd be happy to happy to help you with it one of the one of the businesses or one of the things we're going to be doing is is around the, the topic of warrior. So we're setting up the self-defense school again because shut with COVID and I was busy with pillow, but warrior, we want to bring the topic of the mindset, the philosophy of being a warrior back in business, but definitely in life and, you know, being confident and how you see what's happening in the world. It's not, not taking care of your self-defense and being responsible for your own being isn't an option anymore. So we can definitely talk about that and the warrior mindset and the new book, The Warrior Rules. Your what? Your new book? Yeah, The Warrior Rules. So it's rule, my rules of life, my my warrior rules of, you know, what the things I try to live by every single day. Yeah. Is this getting published or is this your own? Yeah, book? yeah it's, I love it. It's been sitting about somewhere for uh, for ages. So it's it's been done for a year, um, a year and a year and a bit. I just, during COVID wasn't the time. So talking about being a warrior when, you know, there's people fearful and dying and stuff and losing businesses, it just, I didn't feel right to do it. And people were very snowflakey. So you'll see the t-shirt here. This is a thing and I'll tell you guys, you can watch out for it. Uh, Lots of personal things here, some weird tapping, some lots of whiskey things over in the corner. There'll always be something in the video to offend a snowflake. So... um, (laughs) Look out for it. Uh, you, you'll see it and it'll offend somebody, but being offended is a choice. So. It's always unique, uniqueness to offend, I would say. Uh, I was going to say, who's your girlfriend behind you? But um, yeah, loving yeah. that. Well, you take me, you can give what long hours it gets lonely in this office. <laughs> it's a bit like Will Smith uh, in his, what was the program when everyone just scattered and he was talking to a dummy? What was it? I am legend. Yes, I am a legend. So I just want to say you have been a legend, Scott. I've loved it. So thank you so much. I really, oh, really you, appreciate your time and helping everyone here, but also most importantly on the Facebook group. So thank you. Appreciate it. Well, well it was nice to see some of you. Um, Margaret, Fiona, Andrew, it was a pleasure to see you. Brian, Blair, Emma, see you. seen you before. So pleasure to meet all the new people. And thank you very much for listening, guys, and your nice questions. And thanks, Paula, for inviting me on and being so kind. Oh, that was mega. I absolutely loved it. I could, you fascinated me. I could be with you for more hours. It just, I'm just mindful of people's. Tell you one bloody thing. She's not that nice in her bloody coaching sessions. You're lucky, Scott. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, there's the lovely Brian. (laughs) You have to be nice to you. You appear to be brutal to, to. Hey, I nearly quit at the beginning because of how brutal she was. <laughs> but you didn't, and that's the main thing. You didn't. You know, this is what I love, Scott, about people. Be brutal with me, Paula. Be brutal so you test it. Yeah, yeah, can you handle it, handle it? 
be brutal. He's on. He's on about quitting, but um, he's still here, Brian. Still here. See, when you come to my self-defence classes, uh, you get booted in the balls or uh, punched in the face. So as long as she doesn't start hitting you in the groin, then, you know, she's not been brutal. Uh, but, you, but you don't do what you're told in a self-defence class, you, you get a kick in the groin. I just twist the nipples. <laughs> anyway, that's a different thing anyway. Oh, yes. Call that off. <laughs> you I like that. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, have great fun. Take care. Uh, Thanks, guys. Thanks. See you Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. See you all.